I thought it'd be interesting to talk about making use of used server hardware in your home network and home lab. And I'm not talking about the big, huge enterprise servers that are power hungry, hot, noisy, and just, just super bulky, heavy. And I'm not talking about that type of server hardware. I'm talking about power efficient hardware. And in particular, the Intel Atom processors, especially the C3000 series, but the C2000 series is used for server hardware and for low power, like, you know, network appliances, or even like just a, just a simple, like lightweight server. If you want, if you need something with a bunch of network interfaces, but I decided that I want something that has more server enterprise grade features, but on a budget friendly used you know, server motherboard and it's, it's also power efficient. So I don't want like these power hungry boards and noisy and all, I don't want to take up a lot of space for this. The first server motherboard that I got was a, just an old Intel Xeon processor. And so it makes a nice little, you know, low power, not super fast, but fast enough motherboard for my TrueNAS server. But I also have a TrueNAS replication backup server that I just set up and I made use of the Zima Blade and it's a little NAS kit that I got because it was a sponsored item. I was like, oh, maybe I'll just try it out and see how it works as a replication backup. It doesn't need to have all that power that my main server has. It's just copying data sets over there. It just gives me a little extra copy, a local copy. So I don't have to go and download it off from the cloud, all my stuff that I have backed up there. And, you know, it doesn't hurt to have one extra backup and it's, it's pretty energy efficient. So it doesn't cost a lot to run that. So I thought I'd replace it with a little more of a server grade motherboard because I can get ECC RAM, not necessarily required, but it's nice to have with ZFS, but I also wanted IPMI on it. And I also wanted to have a 10 gig interface on it instead of just that one gigabit interface. That way I could replicate things faster, even though it's only doing, I think, I believe the differences between the data changes that's been made, but it definitely would be great to have 10 gigabits between my main TrueNAS server and my replication server. So I can do those tasks quicker. Maybe I can maybe do it a little more frequently or something like that. So that way, you know, it doesn't slow anything down. Uh, so I, when I looked at the CPU usage of the Zima blade and even, and even my main TrueNAS server, it idles most of the time. And, and because it's just sitting there, you know, I do offsite backups, stuff like that. A lot of these things don't ramp the CPU up that much. So that's why I believe that the, this Intel C2000 series, you know, the single thread performance is a little bit lower than the Zima blade. I think it'll still be adequate because it's got more cores. It's got eight cores instead of four. So without further ado, I'll talk about the hardware that I purchased and then I'll show you why I think it'll be a good little board just for a backup server. So here it is, the motherboard in all of its glory, the Super Micro. It's just a mini ITX motherboard. So it's super compact. It has a lot of networking interfaces on it. They're only one gigabit Ethernet interfaces, but there is a PCI 2.0 by eight lane slot here. So I can put a 10 gig NIC in it. I already have several that, that run under PCIe 2.0 and I don't really have any use for them. So I was, you know, I might as well make use of that. And it should be able to get the full 10 gigabits because that's, you get two gigabytes uh, of bandwidth, which is 16 gigabits. And there's a little bit of overhead. So maybe you get about 14, so that's plenty of bandwidth to get the full 10 gigabit bandwidth here. The hard drives are only gonna get three to four gigabits, right? Uh, spinning disks. So, that'll be fine for a replication backup. And then it came with 16 gigabytes of ECC RAM, which is great. All this was $99 US dollars. So even with the 16 gigs of RAM, so it's pretty affordable because I looked up this motherboard and even knew they were you know, between 415 to $500 or so. And for a new board, I'm like, wow, they're still selling them for, and that's not even with any RAM. So I got 16 gigs of RAM and it's used and it still looks like it's in pretty good shape. And as you see, it has a little heat sink here. And this is the you know Intel C2758 CPU is the exact model for this. And it's just eight cores as I mentioned earlier. And what's interesting is this, this CPU had a CPU glitch that caused it not to boot at, you know, after a certain amount of time or whatever, it would just fail. And then there's, there's a TPM header here somewhere and you could put a resistor on it. If someone's figured it out that you could put a resistor on it solder on there or whatever and it would boot back up again and be fine <laughs> so you, you, there's a little hack you can get at the boot which is very strange but they fixed that glitch i believe in a newer revisions of this cpu in this series and i took off the heat sink and i looked at the cpu and it has the stepping on it and i looked up on serve the homes website and they had a listing of what the newer revisions are that fix that cpu bug and fortunately 
this CPU has that revision. So I was happy to see that because I'm hoping that means it won't fail catastrophically like it would before and fail the boot and you'd have to do that little hack. But at least there's a workaround if I have to do that. I don't really want to have to solder something on this board. But uh, so that was something I didn't realize until after I bought the board. I should have done a little more research, but I didn't realize it was a big deal about, <laughs> uh, for these type of boards. So, but uh, no harm done because I think I have the new revision. So that's great. But I guess there's a little bit of a risk if you buy this for this purpose that you know, just keep that in mind if you want to try something like this out. Another thing that's interesting is, you know, it has IPMI, which is what I like because I don't have to use a KVM over IP or a USB device or whatever to uh, remotely manage this. So it's great to have that. My main two nest box, which has a super micro board also has IPMI. So it's great to have those my main servers that have more server grade type features. It's just built in. I like that. I actually took some time on this board. It used the old, like it had like a Java web applet. Fortunately, they still had updates for this device, even from a couple years ago. You know, this is an older board that updated that applet, got rid of it and used HTML5 instead, which is what their newer motherboards use, which is great because a lot of browsers don't, won't even support Java applets anymore for security reasons. And it's just the plugin is just that supports is not there really in, in a lot of modern web browsers. I couldn't even use this IPMI management, which I was disappointed in because that's one of the features I really wanted to have. And so I was getting a little bit worried that I maybe made a bad decision, but luckily with that firmware update, it worked successfully on this board. And I was able to get into the management just like my other super micro motherboard. So that's great. So now I'll have another board with that same functionality. This motherboard only has six SATA ports on it, which is fine. I'm going to use two for the SATA SSDs for the boot discs. Just so I have it mirrored. And that gives me four SATA ports just for the storage, which right now I'm only using two discs for in my replication backup. And that gives me a little bit more room to, to throw some uh, extra drives in there once I get rid of them from my main TrueNAS box and now I can just move them over to this one. I don't need a ton of storage, so that should be adequate for me. I realized when I was going to do this project that I didn't have any extra power supplies laying around. And so to help me complete this project, Be Quiet sent me one of their power supplies and they actually have a couple lower power options, which is nice in a smaller form factor than ATX. And most people are familiar with ATX power supplies, but they actually have other form factors that, that Be Quiet sells. Uh, in particular, there's a form factor called SFX, which is smaller than ATX and it's made for you know mini ITX and motherboard builds, which is what I'm doing. Although I'm putting mine in a, a one of my for you chassis that I'm not using. I used to use it for my Proxmox backup server until I went to more efficient hardware that was using a mini PC. So I was able to save a lot of 50, 60 watts or more of power by going to a mini PC. And but I'm just going to reuse that chassis for that build. So I don't really need a smaller power supply, but I thought it'd be nice to have one because if I ever want to build a mini ITX build in the future, I can just repurpose this power supply. And as you can see, this is what it looks like. Power supply is the size of 120 millimeter fan. That's why it's like almost like smaller than my hand uh, and the width there. And so you can see it right here. It's a fully modular power supply, which is, I love all of Be Quiet's power supplies are fully modular. You can pick whatever cables you want and keeps things pretty clean. And there's plenty of connectivity options. This one is one of their higher wattage, smaller form factor ones. So I don't really need, this is like 500 watts. I don't really need that. They have some, I think as low as 300 watts. It even comes with this little plate. So I can adapt this power supply into an ATX system and so this will work out great because i need this for the, my for you chassis i'm going to be using for this build so i think i'll be quiet for sending this over to me so here's what it looks like with the motherboard in there and the power supply with nothing else connected in you see how small the motherboard is in this huge for you chassis interestingly the user manual says you can power this motherboard with a 12 volt four pin connector and i tried it and it didn't seem to work so i had to switch to the 24 pin so here's the completed build with the motherboard. You can see I have the 10 gig SFP plus NIC in it with all the SATA cables connected as well as the 24 pin power supply. And I got the fans and the chassis connected as well to the power cables. So everything is connected to the drives that are in there and I have a hot swap bay in the front. Also, before I put this in my TrueNAS replication backup, I want to try this out as an OpenSense box just to see for demonstration purposes to see how this would work. If you just want a simple gigabit network, this might be great for that. And you can still put a 10 gig NIC or two and a half gig NICs in here if you want to get some extra bandwidth. And this, for routing purposes, this might still be adequate for basic routing. You know, IDS, IPS, this is not going to work so well for that. But not everybody wants that or needs that. 
for their network if you just wanted to keep it simple. So I'm going to explore that just real quick just to see how this would work because this would be, it could be a nice low power, like more server grade type hardware that you could use for your home network. So basically I, I threw the hard drive in the system that I was using for my full network build into this micro ATX motherboard build that I'm doing. This is a test. Is it that way? I don't have to reinstall everything. I just had to reconfigure some interfaces. You can see I'm using the Atom CPU processor here. It has eight cores, eight threads, and you can see the CPU temperature. It's not too bad considering it just has a uh, heatsink on it with no fan on the heatsink. It's just the fan air blowing through the case, and it's not high velocity fan, so I feel like that's pretty good. Uh, some mini PCs get about this temperature. Some get higher, some get lower. Uh, CPU temperature, some of in the 50s, so I think this is pretty reasonable. And especially since it's not really done too much. I've seen it when I was doing it earlier, it's 40, 40 degrees Celsius. So um, anyway, so let's go do a quick speed test. I wanna show you the performance of this because this CPU is older. So now we're on one of my client machines. I got my two N100 systems and I'm just gonna do a speed test because they're on two different networks, two different VLANs on the same 10 gig interface that we have set up. So let's go ahead and run this. We'll see what we get. I'm just on a single stream to start off with to see what performance we can expect on this system. We're getting about 1.2 gigabit. So we're getting a little bit faster than a gigabit because a gigabit, you're only gonna get about 930, 940 megabits. So we're getting a little bit faster than a gigabit. So this system can definitely handle gigabit routing uh, pretty easily. You wouldn't be able to do hardly any IDS, IPS type things, but you could do some lighter weight things, you know, some block lists and stuff like that, it should be fine. But you can see the performance is not so good here, but let's try multiple streams. I'll show you what, what we end up getting. We'll do four parallel streams and the performance is a little bit better I, when I test this out. So that so it seems like to me it's a single core thread limit usually is what, what, what causes this because when you start doing multiple streams, it can spread that out over, over different CPU cores. You see how now we're getting like four gigabits uh, across uh, four different streams. And I tried more than four and it, didn't, it doesn't scale beyond that pretty well, that, that much. But And this is actually a little bit better than what I was getting earlier. I was getting about a little bit under three gigabits to three gigabits. It was about, I was getting about 2.7, 2.8 gigabits a second. I was playing around with enabling RSS and it perhaps that increased per throughput a little bit, but I still get a little bit extra throughput if you have multiple streams. So you can still benefit from having a 10 gig interface in this if you're doing routing. If you have multiple one gigabit streams on your network, this could still potentially be beneficial you know, across your VLAN. So you could still have a little bit less of a bottleneck. So it's good to kind of get a rough idea of what kind of performance you can expect with this CPU. And I didn't really get it for this purpose anyway, but I just wanted to check this out real quick before uh, I actually used it in a TrueNAS build that I'm going to do. So one thing I wanted to show real quick is a speed test between my two TrueNAS servers that are connected to a dedicated 10 gig network backend that's not connected to the rest of my network, it's just on its own VLAN by itself. It doesn't have internet access or anything like that. Which the nice thing about doing that is you can enable jumbo frames on just that one VLAN and that one network. And it's easy to set all of the high speed storage devices to the same jumbo frame. That's I feel like that's where it's useful uh, to get the maximum throughput. Jumbo frames doesn't give you that much more bandwidth unless you're getting 10 gigabit interfaces or higher because you can gain an extra 500 megabits or so. On the 10 gig interfaces, if you enable it, I'm probably never going to reach that unless I start using SATA SSDs or NVMe drives in my storage pools, but I just like to have it all the same so then that there's no hindrance in throughput. So if you look at this, I have my iPerf 3 test ready to go, and I'm going to go ahead and run it, and we'll see how close to 10 gigabits we can get. You know, there's always overhead on all the network interfaces, so you don't never get the maximum speed for the interface, but you get pretty close. As you can see, I'm getting 9.87 gigabits. That's usually about the max you can get for 10 gig. I've seen it be 9.9, 9.89 or whatever on some devices, but that's pretty good considering it's just on a slower machine. So this shows that it's capable of 10 gigabits. So if there's anything that's less than this speed, it's a disk bottleneck, right? So at least I know the networking aspect is not bottlenecked. So that's great to see. I can even reverse the it if I want and have it sending from the other system if I do it this way. You'll see if I reverse the direction coming into the box, it's uh, just slightly slower, but not bad at all. And I'm not sure why it's barely slower, but it just, well, maybe just that little warming up a little bit there because <laughs> now it's about the same. Now same speed in both directions is pretty good. Uh, I know some systems sometimes have trouble getting the same speed in both directions. Sometimes it's a transceiver 
problem between SFP modules and incompatibilities there. Sometimes you get one-way speeds that are different. I know Jeff Gearling has mentioned that on some of his uh, posts a long time ago when he's playing around with 10 gigabits. And so uh, it's good to see that I can get basically the same speed in both directions, even on this slower system. Even though, as I demonstrated with OpenSense, you don't seem to get that full throughput when you're doing routing across VLANs on the same interface for whatever reason. But as a client, 10 gigabits works really well on even slower machines. As you can see here with the one week view of my CPU usage, there's only a few little spikes here every now and then, but it still doesn't even come close to 50% CPU utilization. And I think I have the hardware properly sized for my use case and the workload that I need. And I, and I was pleased to see that because I like being able to keep my power consumption is still pretty low on this backup system, but also have more server grade features. Hope you enjoyed this little demonstration how you can repurpose hardware such as this in your home network and home lab just for what if you have a specific need such as like what I have and to find something like this useful because I like having hardware that meets the need more exactly instead of just like throwing a bunch of hard you know, overkill hardware necessarily at it. I like having hardware that's sized appropriately and still has a little bit of room for a growth, you know, because I could I could slap more than 16 gigs of RAM in here if I want. I mean, it's got a little bit of expansion in this, not a lot. But I feel like for the purpose of being a backup system, this is going to be great. I thought about replacing my main TrueNAS box maybe with a C3000 series processor, which has got more RAM. It's got higher bandwidth than this. It has, you know, the PCI slots are PCIe 3.0 instead of 2.0. And if, they might even, I think, have a micro ATX version instead of an ITX version, which gives you two PCI slots. So you get a little more expansion there. So you can maybe slap some more drives in there and you know, and still get some faster networking as well. And some of the, some of the C3000 series boards already have 10 gigabits, you know, SFP built into the motherboard. So you already have high speed networking on the board and you, you still have one or two additional slots. So that would give you potentially some room for, if you want to, you know, put a uh, HBA card in there, right? If you, I'll keep you up to date, you know, if there's anything interesting that happens with it over time and, but just let you know how it works or if you have any questions about it. Yeah, you know, feel free to ask. I try to get to all the questions, but it's getting a little bit harder as I get more feedback and comments. So until next time, I'm Dustin Casto, and I'll see you in the next video.